Good morning and welcome to this service of worship from Bells Corners United Church. We're so glad that you've joined us today, whether you're here in the sanctuary, viewing the YouTube video from home, listening to us on your telephone, or reading the service from the comfort of your chair. It's a blessing to have you share this time with us. This morning is SOSA Sunday at BCUC. SOSA is an acronym that stands for Service, Outreach, and Social Action. Vital aspects of our life as a congregation who follows the teachings of Jesus. I'm grateful to the members of our SOSA committee who have helped to plan and take part in this service and to the United Church of Canada for the resources provided to help us do so. Even in these pandemic times when our activities are restricted, our faith community is still busy and vibrant. Please take a moment to look at the announcements at the end of our video and on our website to see what is happening at BCUC and to find opportunities where you can take part. Let us now gather our hearts and minds for worship with the lighting of the Christ candle. As we light the candle this morning, we center ourselves in the assurance that God is with us in all times and places, in the assurance that Jesus is among us as we gather to understand the messages of Scripture and their place in our world today. As we begin this time together with open hearts and minds, may the Holy Presence and this shining light guide us on the path to realizing God's kingdom here in this earthly world. Please join me in the call to gather. There is a great longing for justice making and keeping, a hunger for waters of justice, a thirst for ever flowing streams of righteousness. There is a spiritual poverty that accompanies all other forms of poverty, fragmented and dislocated community, frustrated values, webs of indifference. We are called to be attentive, faithful in sharing what we can out of the resources and connections that are at hand. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Holy One, there are times when charitable food, even warm suppers and timely hampers, do not satisfy the deeper and wider longings for justice. The emptiness in people's bellies and pocketbooks are not the only realities. As we crave the food of justice, so we feel cravings for fairness and equality. Embarrass us, even trick us, into breaking cycles and systems of indifference that breed cynicism and unfair distributions of power. In the name of Jesus, your challenging and nourishing presence in our midst. Amen. Thank you. 
Today I'd like to share a few pages from this book with you. It's called On Our Street, Our First Talk About Poverty. In this book, there's a lot of big questions and asking questions is a good idea, especially when we see things that are different and we don't understand. So let's go check out the first big question in this book. On the walk to school today, I saw a man sleeping on the street. He had all his belongings around him. Why would he sleep outside? Do you have any ideas? Well, this book has big questions and it also has some ideas that help us think about the answers. That person is sleeping on the street because he does not have a permanent place to live. That person is experiencing homelessness. People who are experiencing homelessness live on the street or they might live in community shelters. People are often in that situation because of poverty. Poverty is a big problem in our world today. Have you heard that word before, poverty? It can mean lots of different things, actually. The simplest definition is that it's when a person doesn't have enough money for basic things they need, like shelter or food or clothing. But it can also mean some other things. And we'll see that in some of the other big questions coming up. Let's turn the page. Are there children who are homeless? What do you think? Yeah, you're right. Yes, people of all ages can experience homelessness. Young children who are homeless may live with their families in community shelters. These shelters provide families with food, warm clothing, and basic services. Other families may even live in their cars. Older children are sometimes experiencing homelessness because they've run away from their homes. They may not feel safe or loved where they are. Are homeless people the only ones who live in poverty? Do you think that's true? Think about what we talk about, what poverty means. No, being homeless is only one kind of poverty. There are other kinds of poverty that are harder to see, like when people are not able to go to school or when people don't have access to doctors or people who may not have enough food to eat or the proper clothing to wear for cold days or hot days, or really rainy days. In our Sunday School materials this week, there's a video of a girl who's experiencing poverty, and she has a really hard time getting enough food to eat. It might be really interesting to go check that out. One more big question I like to share from the book. What can we do to help people who live in poverty? I bet you have some great ideas. The book you can see has a whole page of things. I'm not going to read them all, but I love what they have at the top. It says, one of the most important things you can do is care. Ask questions. Remember that everyone matters and we can work together to help those living in our community. And that's the big part, eh? is building a community. And the SOSA committee is doing a great job partnering with all sorts of different community groups to help build the community, make it stronger, and help the people who don't have all the basic needs. So we'll think about the work that you do and think about things that you can do too. The book has some great ideas like donating food and toiletry items to food banks or donating gently used clothing to charity groups. I love the ideas too here of introducing yourself to your neighbors and new kids in class 
that helps build community, doesn't it? As well as learning about other uh, diverse cultures in your community too. Anything we can do to learn about each other, to gain respect for each other, and help each other out. Let's have a little prayer together. Loving God, thank you for all the blessings we have. Food to eat, a place to stay, warm clothing. God, bless the work of the SOSA committee and help us to find ways we can support our communities too. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. O oh God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear what you are saying to us today. Amen. Our readings today are from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, and Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. From Micah what God requires. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And from Jeremiah, Thus says the Lord, Do not let the wise boast in their wisdom. Do not let the mighty boast in their might. Do not let the wealthy boast in their wealth. But let those who boast boast in this, that they understand and know me, that I am the Lord. I act with steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, says the Lord. Together may we reflect on the word and be moved into the world. Amen. I had a difficult time choosing the readings for this year's Sosa Sunday service, not because it was hard to find appropriate ones, but because there are so many that are perfectly suited to a service devoted to service, outreach, and social action. In fact, as we read through our Bible, both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, it's very clear that the kind of life we're called to as Christians is deeply rooted in those very things, service, outreach, and social action. And so I chose these two readings that speak to what it takes to live out this calling, kindness, justice, right relations, and humility. 
When we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, we can see these things in action. It's obvious that these readings from the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures that formed the foundation of his own faith, were the foundation of what Jesus lived and taught. As his followers, it's right that these should form the foundation of our own work in the world. The words of Micah in the familiar hymn roll off our tongues. What does the Lord require of you to seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? Words written thousands of years ago in a world very different from ours today. Let's take some time this morning to look at how these concepts apply in our lives, in the huge global community where the needs are not only many, but complicated. What actions are these words calling us to in this time and place where we find ourselves? Those of us in this congregation, here in the capital of Canada, live in one of the wealthiest and most peaceful places in the world. Yet even in this wonderful place, we hear cries for justice. Justice for the thousands of Indigenous children sent to residential schools and for the generations affected by them. Justice for the different, those who are different in looks, in sexuality, in gender identification, in ability, in culture or language or belief. Justice for the poor, the underpaid, those without a roof over their heads or enough food to eat, those who work hard and still struggle to make ends meet, and those unable to work. Justice for those suffering from disease, injury, mental illness, or addictions. Justice for those looking for a place safe from violence, from places far away or from situations right here in our own community. Justice for those who cannot speak for themselves, the very young, the very old, the infirm. Kindness is certainly a place to begin as we face these many calls for justice. And that kindness has to begin with open ears, open hearts, and open minds, even as we open our doors and our wallets. These two things, justice and kindness, are easy to get behind, even if they're not always easy to do. It makes sense to us that everyone should be treated fairly and with kindness, of course. But it's not always easy to be kind to someone who's lashing out and hurt and anger. And the path to justice is not always clear. It's complicated. Perhaps that's where the humble walking, the humility, comes in. In our lectionary study group this week, we struggled a bit with this concept of being humble. How do you walk humbly with God? Well, it seems pretty easy when we think of God being all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful. In God's presence, it would seem natural to be awed and humbled. But how do we walk humbly with God in this world? A world that seems so full of loud voices, of the powerful pushing their way to the front of the line so their views can be heard. Won't they drown out the humble, kind voices in the background? When we think of social activism, the kind that leads to justice, we expect loud voices and standing up front. We talk about fighting for justice. How can we fight for justice by being humble? Where does being humble fit in this picture? Perhaps it's our understanding of that word humble that's causing the confusion. We realized in our study group that we equate being humble with being meek and mild. It seems odd then to put it in the same list as seeking justice. Being kind, perhaps, that could be a quiet thing. And it fits with our Jeremiah passage about not boasting. But when is the struggle for justice a quiet thing? Especially with the in when the injustices we see are so widespread and blatant especially when there are so many powerful forces around us who are not on the same page. Doesn't the fight for justice need self-confidence? Can we be self-confident and humble at the same time? How does that work? When trying to understand Old Testament scriptures, especially when we want to apply them to today, I find that it can be helpful to look at what modern Jewish theologians say have to, have to say. And one of my favorites is Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Here's what he says. Humility, true humility, is one of the most expansive and life-enhancing of all virtues. 
It does not mean undervaluing yourself. It means valuing other people. And humility is not thinking you're small. It is thinking that other people have greatness within them. These statements speak to me. They turn around my thinking that being humble means being self-effacing. It doesn't mean diminishing our own strengths. It means trusting that those around us also have strengths. Strengths that we should also not diminish. Last Sunday, October 17th, was marked as the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. It's an observance that was declared by the United Nations General Assembly in 1992, and I'm embarrassed to say that this year was the first time I was aware of it. Poverty, says the UN, is a violation of human rights. It's an injustice. This year, the SOSA Committee decided to make poverty the focus of this worship service, with particular emphasis on the concept of a GLI, a Guaranteed Livable Income. This is a concept that the United Church of Canada is putting much effort and support toward, and one that members of SOSA have put much effort and study into. We know that this is a complicated issue, even a contentious one. We're not demanding or even asking that you put your support behind this on our say-so. We are asking, however, that you give it thoughtful consideration, that you take the time to read, to ask your questions, to listen to the stories, that you do the hard work with open minds and hearts and with that attitude of humility. So I'm not going to preach to you this morning about the virtues or the shortcomings of GLI. This is the United Church, after all, a place where we proudly say you don't have to leave your brain at the door. And that's a statement that also means that we encourage and expect you to use that brain in a way that both satisfies your intellect and moves you along the path that Jesus asks us to follow. A path where loving your neighbor as yourself is the key consideration. A path where seeking justice and spreading kindness are how we show that love. And a path we walk with open hearts and minds and the humble understanding that we don't hold all the wisdom in the room. I'm going to ask you to look at the injustice of poverty through that lens, to look at our present social programs that attempt to bridge the gap between the haves and the have-nots, and to consider ways of both improving the system and making it align with our calling as followers of the teachings of our Bible, both the prophets of the Hebrew Scriptures and the example of Jesus. I want to share a story with you, one that had a profound effect on my own thinking about poverty and how we deal with it in our society. It happened when I was doing a field placement with OEC that involved being in the community houses of the subsidized housing areas we served, often on the days when the food banks were in operation. Over the years that I was doing this work, I had the opportunity to see several different food banks at Pinecrest Terrace, Morrison Gardens, and the Parkdale Food Centre. I wasn't involved directly in the food banks themselves, but in building relationships with the folks who use them. Each food bank was unique in its approach, and I was able to see the effect that using a food bank had on the clients. I won't go into all the details this morning, but two of them used a system where clients took a number on arrival and registered, and then waited for a worker to invite them to an upstairs office where they were told what they could have according to their need as determined by an official formula. The worker then filled out a form that matched those needs with what food was available that day, with some choice given to the client where possible. The client then went back downstairs to wait until they were called for their turn in the basement, where they handed over the list and a volunteer got the items for them. It was very efficient. Then the client got to lug everything upstairs and carry it home. There was some great stuff in those bags for sure. We were pretty good at donating food after all. Food that we feel is appropriate. People on both sides were usually kind and polite. My visit to the Parkdale Food Center showed me something completely different. Clients arrived and rode an elevator to the basement where the food bank is housed. When they arrived, they stopped at a small office and gave their name, and a worker punched it into a computer, and a list was printed that showed their allotment. Not by specific food items, but by categories. Three items from this category, two from that one, etc., 
And then they continued down the hall to a room with a big harvest table, offering coffee, muffins or scones, sometimes soup and sandwiches, and a group of people chatting comfortably while they waited their turn to shop. Yes, shop. They were given a shopping cart and they walked the aisles of shelves that were organized by those categories on their sheet. A worker accompanied them to help if needed, reaching things, interpreting, or explaining the list or items that were there. One lady I know refers to this as having a personal shopper. And when they got to the dairy section, everyone got a dozen eggs, a carton of milk and butter. And around the corner from that was the produce section, laid out just the way we expect at the grocery store. At this point, the worker stood back and the shopper helped themselves to whatever they wanted. No restrictions on items or quantities. And the same was true of a shelf of personal care items, toothbrushes, shampoo, menstrual products, diapers, deodorant. Two very different approaches. Two very different ways of showing justice, kindness, and humility. Two different systems for offering a helping hand to someone. Both got the job done, but one kept the client's dignity intact and trusted them to choose what would best meet the needs of their family at this particular time. One that allowed for cultural choices. Times of celebration where a cake mix and a bottle of pop might be called for, or specific dietary restrictions with no questions asked, no explanation necessary. All three food banks offered a generous and necessary service, but I suspect you've already thought about which place you'd rather go. Being poor is expensive, not just emotionally, but in practical terms. It doesn't allow you to take advantage of sales or bulk buying. It doesn't give you the choice to shop around. It doesn't give you the opportunity to put some money aside to get the things that will move you ahead. More schooling, transportation, a better place to live. Our social safety nets are wonderful. They allow for medical care, for assistance with housing and food security, for education, but they often come with many restrictions. Restrictions that keep people from moving beyond needing them. Are there people who take advantage of those systems? We know there are. Will there be people who take advantage of a GLI? Yes, there will. But I encourage you to read the stories of how the pilot projects of basic income guarantees changed the lives of so many. How not having to prove to the authorities and proclaim to the community that you need help kept dignity intact, and gave both opportunity and enough self-confidence to get a job or go back to school to be a member of the community. Our readings from Micah and Jeremiah this morning ask us to do the work of justice and kindness with humility, the kind of humility that Rabbi Sachs talks about, the kind of humility that values others and honors their wisdom. The kind of humility that invites people into community, rather than fortifying the walls that separate those on the margins from those on the inside. So, on behalf of Sosa, and Micah, and Jeremiah, and Jesus, and all who are struggling to find justice, I ask you to read what the UCC has to say about GLI. To read the stories, ask the questions, and have the discussions to put aside ego and open yourself to the wisdom of others. Don't be satisfied with what you've read on Facebook or heard on the street or even here this morning. Take the time to do the work, to seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Amen. Before I read the prayers, I'd like to mention that they were written by the Reverend Susan Eagle, Chair of the Shining Waters Social and Ecological Justice Commission, and Barry Reader from the Jane Finch Community Ministry, with whom we have an interesting connection. Back in the 1980s, several local churches were exploring the possibility of establishing a community chaplaincy among our social housing neighbourhoods. A little later, the Ottawa West End Community Chaplaincy came into being and it was based on the Jane Finch model. 
God of all peoples, creator of a grand cosmos and tiny infants, source of nurture and creation, you call us into relationship with each other. We remain in our own judgment when we turn away from those of us who suffer in the midst of affluence and pandemic and the struggle to survive. Open us to the cries of others and our hearts to your persuasive spirit. May we acknowledge the needs among us and advocate for the fair distribution of resources. May we learn the politics of justice and adequacy that we may act with justice, love kindness and move with humility. Today we remember all who struggle to survive. We specially hold in our hearts low-income racialized communities who have experienced the most challenges with COVID. We pray for our political leaders that they act with compassion as they are asked to give leadership to implement a guaranteed livable income. Remind us, Holy Wisdom, that through your love we encounter in each person, friend or stranger, Christ's light and love in the world. Grant that we may promote the justice and acceptance that enables peace, a true shalom. Help us to remember that we are one world and one family. All this we ask in the name of Jesus and in these ancient words he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We each come with our own special gifts and we come as a gifted congregation marked by abundance. And so we take this time to offer our gifts, our time, talents and treasures. If you're not on par and wish to send in your offerings and donations, you can drop them in the mailbox by the kitchen door of the church or mail them to BCUC. You can also send in your support through e-transfer. Thank you for your continued love and support to Bells Corners United Church. Let us pray. Gracious God, you've lit the way and we've noticed the need. We offer our gifts that they may, in turn, reflect your light and reveal your love. Amen. Go into the world with courage and conviction to seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. And may the blessing of God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, and of Christ who summons us to service, and of the Holy Spirit who inspires generosity and love, be with us all. Amen.
Christmas saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Hear the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome. All Oh,